All right, all right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. We're glad you're here. If you don't know me, my name is David Johnson. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, before we get started, I just want you to know um, that I care a lot about you. Um, I care a lot about you, and I pray for you, and I believe that God has an incredible future set aside for you. I believe that God has an incredible future set aside for us as well, collectively, as a church, as we're following Jesus together. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be with you this morning to share a little bit about what God has placed on my heart. Again, I'm grateful for Pastor Allen and the overseers and all the staff and you for welcoming you and milking me into your, your home this morning. Um, it's an amazing season here at the church, amen? It's an amazing time. We see God do incredible work. I hope you realize, as you're here in a seat, I hope you realize how good you have it. You do. This, what you're experiencing here at Community Church, it isn't common. It's not just happening everywhere. God is moving, and God is blessing, not only through the staff, but through you, as you are responding to the call to be the church. Come on, John. Come on, John. So keep it up. Keep it up. The best is yet to come. Um, we read the Bible here as the church. Yeah, we read the Bible. Um, but we are, we're out of analog Bibles in back. And so if you want to follow along, get out your phone. It will also be up on the screen as we're reading some text. But the analog Bible is called books. Okay. So how many of you, how many of you, um, have ever gotten a call or a text from a number you didn't recognize? Come on, come on. And there's nothing worse, right, than when that, when that foreign text pops up and it's kind of sensitive and you don't know who it's from, but they keep on going on and on about, about something and you're like, oh my goodness, am I supposed to know who this is? I should have this number. And so then you grab the number and you throw it in Google just to find out, you know, if you can find out anything about the number. Um, and then you ask your friends, you copy and paste it, and you're like, hey, so I got this text. It's getting kind of tough. And uh, do you know who this is? Uh, do, you know, do you know who's, who's sending this? Do you, have, do you have this number in your phone? And, and they're like, no, man, I don't have it. And so finally, so finally you just have to, like, suck it up, right? And you're like, hey, listen, um, uh, so, so who is this? Sorry, I got, I got a new phone. Or, or uh, man, I, you know, like, my computer fritzed out. And I lost all my numbers. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I don't have this. I want to talk. I, I'd love to converse in this text conversation, but, but I just don't know who you, who you are. And so I need a little more information. So, so who, who is this? And then you get those, the quick reply. Uh, I am, and you get the dots, the pulsing dots. Who's seen the pulsing dots? Raise your hand. They're really helpful, but they're also anxiety-producing for me. Because you don't know if they started and they just stopped and it's still pulsing, or if they're just writing a really long one. But anyway, you get those three dots as the, as the intensity builds. Anxiety is growing. And then all of a sudden, what happened for me once? This conversation happened, and I was like, so who is this? And it's building, and it's building, and it's building. And then it's just some guy named Craig that was trying to reach the person who had the phone before me, the number, right? It was just like... All this time, wasting, trying to figure things out, whatever, okay. It was a dud of an illustration, but I tried. It was good, thank you. Either way, right? Either way, there was this moment of buildup, this moment of anticipation, this moment for when the mystery, the mystery of I am is revealed. For when the, the question of who is this is finally solved. It's this moment of buildup, of anticipation. It's in this moment that we're going to be focusing on for the next couple weeks as we lead into Easter, as we look at some of these I am statements that Jesus made in the book of John. Statements where Jesus revealed to the surrounding world, the observing world, the truth of who he was. Because I think sometimes, friends, Sometimes it's easy for us to forget that the world didn't always know the reality of Jesus. That Jesus wasn't always known as Jesus. 
The truth is for those living in the first century that knew him, for the first 30 years, all of his neighbors just thought of him as just another guy. Just some guy, the son of Joseph and Mary that was, that was pretty good with a hammer. And yeah, he had his moments early on, but all in all, he wasn't seen as significant. He was born into controversy, born in a barn before moving into a small blue-collar town of Nazareth. And even though he came from the line of David, the royal line, his family didn't have any, his family didn't really have a rich cultural or religious legacy. They were just regular people from a regular town. But just because he wasn't known as Jesus by his neighbors, just because he wasn't known as Jesus, the Savior, the Christ, the Messiah, and the King, just because they didn't know yet doesn't mean he wasn't. The truth is that he just hadn't revealed it to them yet. And this is the place that Jesus finds himself in at the beginning of his ministry. As a relatively unknown 30-year-old rabbi from a small town, but he didn't stay unknown for long, did he? He hit the streets pretty hard at the onset of this book, the Gospel of John. He was preaching about this coming kingdom of God as he was calling his disciples. His disciples, this misfit group of fishermen and, and zealots and tax collectors. And, and then he started doing miracles, and, and then he started publicly criticizing the status quo of the Jewish people. And all the while this was happening, people started to talk. The crowds started to build. They're saying this question, who is this? Who is this? And as his fame grew, next thing we see is he's teaching 5,000 people. How many people are in this room? Wayne, you got an estimate? 375. Picture 15 of this room's. How's that sound? Without a microphone, he must have projected really well. So we see him teaching 5,000 people, and when he was finished, he decides to feed them. So he sends his disciples, fishermen, tax collectors, and zealots, sends them out to find some food, and they come back with two, two fish and five loaves of bread. And, and they're like, hey, uh, Jesus, I like the idea of feeding everyone, but how, how are we going to do this? And so Jesus, what does he do? He takes what was given, and he multiplies the meal. He multiplies it, and it blows everyone away. It leaves everyone stunned, impressed, and a little crazy, just a little crazy. And this is where Pastor Carl picked up last week with the answer to this question, the first answer to the question, so, so who is this? Who are you? And Jesus says to the crowd, he says, I am, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will never hunger again. And this is the answer this, this answer from Jesus, uh, in it, he was saying to, this, to the observing world, to everyone listening to this crowd, he was saying to them, I am who I am. I am the God who spoke to Moses through that burning bush. I am the God who sent bread down from heaven during the Exodus. I am the Savior who led Israel out of, of exile and into the promised land. I am the God of all creation. I am the long-awaited Savior and Messiah for, for God's people come down from heaven to lead you into eternity. I am, and there is no other way. There is no other way than through me. And so the crowd, the crowd, still asking this question, Who is this? Some of them responded in faith, but most responded in disbelief, saying, come on. Is this really the Savior we've been waiting for? Some no-name rabbi from Nazareth? Is this really the Christ? Come on, Jesus. Who do you think you are? You're just Jesus. And this is where the second statement, the second answer to this question comes in. So follow me over to John chapter 8. Real fast, real fast. We're going to start in verse 12. It says this, again, Jesus spoke to them, them being the religious leaders, them being the crowd, them being the witnesses of the miracle with multiplication of the meal, them spoke to them saying, I am 
I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees, they said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Why should we believe you? Why should we listen? And Jesus answers, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from. And I know where I'm going, but you do not know where I came from. And you do not know where I'm going. Jump down to verse 21. So he said to them again, I'm going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Verse 23, you are from below, I am from above. Wow. You are of the world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? We don't get it. Even after all of it, even after the miracles, even after the messages, Jesus says to them, what I have been telling you, what I have been telling you from the beginning, I already told you who I am. Pay attention. I already showed you who I am. Verse 12, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life, of life. And as he was saying these things, verse 30, it says, many believed in him. If you're taking notes today, I'm calling this message, say goodbye to the shadows. Repeat after me. Say goodbye to the shadows. One more time. Say goodbye to the shadows. Good. Roughly 400 years before Jesus hit the scene, there was a philosopher named Plato. Not Plato. I got a one-year-old, and he would say, Plato? Well, he wouldn't say anything yet, but he will someday. And so Plato wrote this famous story that I think helps us process these words of Jesus, this passage. And it's called the allegory or the parable of the cave. In this story, Plato paints a picture of three people chained facing a wall in a cave since childhood. But behind them, the entrance of the cave, there was a fire that would cast shadows on the wall in front of them that they were staring at. Often, objects would be placed between the fire and the people, and it would be to introduce the reality of the world to these prisoners. So it was kind of like this. It's kind of like this. You tell me. So, sorry? Key. Okay, good. You're doing very well. You're doing very well. <clears throat> Next one. <clears throat> come on, come on, come on. Tape. Tape. Good, 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 good. Okay. <clears throat> A pen. You're doing so well. You're doing so well. And then lastly, um, most of you. <laughs> Before, born after 1990, we'll have no idea, but. <laughs> it's a cassette tape. Dad, what is that for? Come on, the glory years of music. So then Plato, right, goes on to say that one day, one day one of these, one of these prisoners was freed. So he turns around and he sees the fire and, and he sees the opening of the cave. And for the first time ever, he realizes that everything he believed to be true was just a shadow. But that isn't a key. It's just a shadow of a key. It's not a pen or a cassette or a thing of tape or whatever. It's just a reflection. It's just a shadow of the real thing. And this is what I think Jesus is getting at when he says, I am the light of the world, that whoever follows me, they won't be chained in the cave of darkness, living in the shadows, but they will have the light of life. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees here, to the professional Jewish leaders saying, what you know and what you believe about God and what he cares about is wrong. It's wrong because you aren't looking at God. You are looking at a shadow of God. A shadow cast from your culture. A shadow cast from the law and from your own pride. But, but if you follow me, if you follow me and believe in me, I will take you out of the cave. 
I'll break the chains that have been holding you down and I will update, I will update your incomplete understanding of reality. Because the world has lied to you. It's lied to all of us. So say goodbye to the shadows and believe in me. Come to the light. Let me show you what is real. Let me show you what is true. Not just for heaven, not just for later, but for today, for here and now. So one day, so one day you can, you can return to that cave. You can return to your friends chained in the dark. And you can shine your light in the shadows, revealing the truth that will set them free. But first, but first, you got to get out of the cave. You got to say goodbye to those shadows. Jesus is saying, I have set you free. Your chains are gone. Follow me out. I am the light of the world. Whoever believes in me follows me will not walk in darkness. But it can be so easy with hindsight. It can be so easy with hindsight to look at these people that Jesus is speaking to and to be like, man, you guys are stupid. You just don't get it. Why don't you see Jesus as Jesus? Why don't you get it? You're missing the point. Don't you know about the cross and the empty grave and, and Easter and No, they don't, but we do. But then I take a quick look in the mirror with the gift of hindsight and the gift of the completed story and the gift of scripture. I look in the mirror and I say, I realize how often I am still looking for truth in the dark. How, how often I find myself staring at shadows Anybody else? Even after seeing the light of Jesus, after being freed from the cave of lies, it's only a matter of time before we find ourselves crawling back in, trying to find comfort in what was comfortable, turning our backs to the light again and again, and staring blindly at the world, at what the world says is true, staring blindly at those shadows. But why do we do it? We all do it, but why do we do it? After seeing the light, why would we go back in the cave? We don't have a ton of time. I want to respect your lunches. But in the time we have left, I'd like to spend it addressing that question for you and also identifying a few of these shadows, the lies that the world sells that I think affect us and hit us the hardest. The first of those shadows, the first of those shadows is love. What does the world say about love? Happy Valentine's Day. The world says that love is sexy and that, wor and that love is physical and you deserve it, that love it's this feeling that can't be explained or contained, this romance that consumes our hearts and minds, that love, it makes me feel, makes me feel good. Has anyone watched The Bachelor? Come on. Come on. Yeah, Rebecca, my wife and I, we turn it on from time to time to laugh. And uh, if you've seen it, you know why. But in it, but in it, no disrespect, come on. But in it, I think we can see perfectly what the world is trying to sell as love. An infatuated, carnal, insecure shadow of what God created love to be. I think it's something more accurately called lust. See, the difference between the shadow and reality is that lust is a selfish pursuit of pleasure and love is a selfless pursuit of purpose. They're both looking for something. But where lust is self-seeking and hedonistic, love, true love, is patient and it's kind. 
It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not self-seeking. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things and believes all things. It hopes all things and endures all things. This, this is the truth of love, and yet we so often settle for the shadows. Even after the chains are broken, even after we've seen the light, we choose to crawl back into that cave. And I think we do it. At least for me. I'm not speaking for you, but more often than not for me, it's because I've because I forget who I am. See if you catch this. I forget who I am because of I am. I forget that I'm with Jesus now and that I am the light of the world, a city on a hill. And I'm meant to shine my, the truth of Jesus to the world. I forget who I am, not because of some crazy, indulgent, epic, sinful moment, but rather a simple failure to prioritize God, the word of God over the word of the world. This life isn't about being strong enough to escape the cave. It's not about being good enough to stay out of the cave. That's a battle we'll never win. It's about, it's not about staying out, but staying in. Staying in the word. And that brings us up to shadow number two, which is shadow number two, which is purpose. What are you made for? World says, work hard, play hard. You deserve it. You deserve to be happy, so treat yourself. It doesn't matter who you screw out of a promotion or, or, or who you hurt to make your life better. It doesn't matter because it's all about you. But what the world tries to sell as purpose is little more than selfish pride. Seeking first the kingdom of me instead of the kingdom of heaven. And I think the difference again, again, between the shadow and reality is that pride is the selfish pursuit of pleasure and true purpose is the selfless pursuit of Jesus. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone more purpose driven, more capable, intentional and successful than Jesus and all throughout his message, all throughout his life, all he did was defer to the father. All he did was say, your kingdom come, your will be done, not mine. Purpose in the shadows is all about me. Purpose in the light is all about the Lord and following Jesus out of the dark and into the light. But to do that, ooh, this is the good stuff, to do that, we need to address the last and I think hands down most dangerous shadow we face, and that is salvation. heaven, your eternity. See, the world says, the shadows show that if you're just good enough, if on the balance you do more rights than wrongs, if you're a pretty moral person, you make it to church on Christmas and Easter, then you'll be, a, you'll be able to avoid punishment. If you're just good enough, you'll be able to avoid hell and spend eternity in heaven. This, this is the salvation that the world is pushing. But in truth, really, they're only selling separation. The world sells it, and the people are buying it. A recent poll says that among, even among unreligious, unspiritual, and agnostic folks, 77% of them still believe that they're going to heaven. Even people who don't believe in heaven think they're going there. There's a disconnect, right? But listen up. This reflection, this shadow is a fallacy and one of eternal consequence. And frankly, 
It, it isn't only seen in the world. We see it in the church every day. It's called cheap grace. It goes something like this. <clears throat> just, raise, just raise that hand up. Invite Jesus into your heart and you will be saved. Your lifestyle doesn't need to change. Doesn't need to change. Just say the prayer. You stay in that cave. Just make sure you're at church every Sunday. You can, stay, you can stay in the cave. Just make sure you're listening to the right music and reading the right books. You can stay in that cave. Just make sure you're taking the right positions on Facebook. Just make sure you're condemning the right people. You can stay in that cave. Just make sure you hide your own sin well enough no one will find it. You can stay in that cave staring at the shadows where it's comfortable. Stay as long as you believe in God and call yourself a Christian. It's all good. But this is a lie. The world is selling it and our friends, our family, and our neighbors are buying it. Maybe some of us, we're buying it. You want it all. But according to Jesus, this lie is one that will leave you separated from God forever. If you don't follow Jesus in this life, you won't be with him in the next. If you're not seeking first the kingdom in this life, you won't be in it in the next. If you don't prioritize God in this life, you won't be with God in the next. Belief, it isn't enough. We need to repent. We need to drop our chains and follow Jesus out of the dark and into that light. There is no kingdom of God in the cave. There is no salvation in the shadows. The world says if you're only good enough, but scripture says there is no one good enough. No one good enough. There's only been one. His name is Jesus in all of human history, capable of earning their way to heaven. There is no one good, not one, but that's not what the world wants to show you. Because the cave, the cave doesn't want you to leave. It wants you to believe that the shadows are as good as it gets, that you'll never be able to escape the chains, that you'll never be free from your addictions, or your vices, or your prejudice, or your sin. The cave wants you to believe that grace could never cover all of you. The shadows want you to believe that mercy could never include you. That you could never be loved, or happy, or successful, or saved, so quit trying. It's too late. This is what the world wants you to believe, but it's a lie. It's just the shadows talking. And that's why the light of Jesus... The light of the world is so important because Jesus wants to break those chains. He wants to lead you out and open your eyes to truth, to enlighten your heart and mind to the realities of this world. And then to take the light you've seen, take the light you've seen back into the shadows, not to fall back into your old patterns, but to expose the dark Break the power of darkness and reveal to the observing world the truth of who God is, the wonder of salvation, the real meaning of, of purpose and life and love. Get out of the cave. Drew's around here somewhere. Where's Drew? Come on up, Drew. Those kids did great today. We're gonna do something a little different now. Not as much, yeah. Not as much jumping around in this moment. I just want Drew to come up and, and we're gonna be doing something together here, so. Um, listen, uh, I'm not here every week, and so I don't, I don't know all of you, and you don't know all of me. Um, so I don't know what kind of caves you find yourself in today. Or I, I don't know what kind of shadows keep begging for your attention, but I need you to hear me. So listen up. I, I need you to hear me when I say that there is no one too lost.
There is no one too broken or too blind for God to find, repair, and restore. There is no chain too strong, no cave too vast or shadow too dark for the God of all creation to break in and take you out, to free you and invite you into a new life. And I know, listen, I know it might not always seem like, I know it might not always seem like it as we stare at the shadows, but even then, even now, for some of us right this second, you need to know that even when your world might seem darkest, God is there next to you. And he's saying, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. Come to me, let me take care of those chains. He's saying, I went into the cave. I went into the grave so you didn't have to. Let me show you a better way. Jesus, he wants us to experience life to the full, to have a robust understanding of truth and the beauty of this world, but you'll never get it. You'll never see it in the cave. You'll never get it staring at shadows. So what shadow do you need to say goodbye to this morning? What cave do you need to crawl out of as Jesus, even in this moment, is calling you to follow him? What broken pieces of your life need to be put back together? What lies need to be dismissed? What chains need to be broken? By the incredible grace of God, Jesus is here and he's for you and he's screaming your name from the cross and he's saying, John, I've got this so you don't have to. He's saying, Carrie, I've got this so we can be together forever. He's saying, Vin, I got this. this because I love you. Now get out of the cave. You were made for more than this. Say goodbye to the shadows and let your light shine out in the darkness. Get out of the cave. It's time to get out of the shadows. So I don't know what you, what you carry with you. We all carry stuff to church. I don't know what, what you're carrying with you today, but we're just gonna take a moment to just kind of rest in this, in the truth of God's love and preferred future for you, in the freedom that God is offering you, in the invitation that Jesus is extending to all of us to follow him out of our darkness, out of our sin, out of our shame, out of our past, and into a new life. We're just gonna take a moment. Just chill out. Let it sink in.